Our Father in heaven, thank you for being with us, and uh, especially through this week. And now, as we've come to Sabbath, we look forward to learning more about you, your plans for us, and what that really means for our lives. Please guide us and direct. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. How many of you, when you were much younger, she doesn't have to be much younger, because some people still do this as a hobby. How many of you had model cars that you made or model airplanes that you made? Model railroads. You had some too. Which ones did you like the most? RC cars, yeah. Well, I had these model cars, and I would make some model airplanes. And when they were all and I had fun doing it, but it was not really a gift of mine. And I would look at it and say, well, that belongs back in the box. And, and yes, it was, it was an enjoyable experience, but it, you know what? I wasn't careful enough, and so back in the box it went after a little bit, and I have no idea where any of them are today. I've moved too many times, and I didn't really care about them. But how many of you have kept one of your models for years and years, and if you wanted to find it, you could find it? Oh, yeah. Oh, very good. So, today we're going to talk a little bit about models, and that's how the lesson started. But, you know, why do we get interested in these models of something? I live right next to the railroad. I go practically through my backyard all day. Okay, so it was, it's experience. you saw them go by, and like, oh, that's interesting to me. Yeah. So it has an interest. I was trying to think, why did I care about these model cars? There's cars all over the place. Uh, but you know what? It's part of, uh, you want to see something that's really, you can afford a little model. It's hard to get the real thing. Um, and most of us are too practical to want to do that all the time. So we have various reasons we use for our models. Let's look a little bit. We're going we're gonna to look, first of all, in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11. And we'll read through it quickly, and then we'll, we'll pull out some pieces. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. Okay, what are we referring to? All under the cloud and all passed through the sea. What's being referred to? The Israelites exiting Egypt. They went through the sea. And what's this under the cloud thing? As a cloud during the day, and uh, was pillar of fire by night. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Baptized into Moses. What's, what does that mean? What's, okay, baptized. Well, so first, what's this term baptized actually referring to? I mean, we, we use baptism in different ways, but... You've, you've, I don't know, uh, we, have, we have some principals and teachers when they get into, the, get into their job and it's been a particularly hard time, we've say, we kind of say, you know, they've been baptized by fire. Does that mean they purposely wanted to go through fire? There's a baptism into the Holy Spirit, 
But, but what, because this is, a, you know, baptized by fire is a fairly, fairly common phrase. But the, and I'm, and uh, yes. It could be trials. Trials. Yes. Yes. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward reality. Oh. And so seeing that they must have gone through inward fire or um, trials. Trials and experiences. But I do like that it's an outward expression of what's happening inside. So when we say baptized by fire, that means the experience that this teacher or this principal has just gone through has been very difficult. And they've experienced difficulties. But usually when we say they're baptized by fire, that means they're now better. They've learned from that. So, so when we say, and all were baptized in Moses, what could that be? They went through these experiences. And those experiences were the cloud and the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food. Well, there's different ways you can interpret that probably, but the spiritual food, once again, it's, these are experiences, things that people have gone through. Um, all drank the same spiritual drink, and, and what pops into our minds when we think of the spiritual drink that the children of Israel drank? Water from the rock. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. Whoa, now this is a little bit different. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And then it's identified, and the rock was Christ. So, the writer, Paul, is looking back at all these experiences. And, and why, why is he trying to pull out these things from the far past history of the Jewish people to the current time. Bring them closer to God. Bring them closer to God. And, and I think it might also be to go beyond that, it's these experiences, this rock you drank from, as we look at it now, has a different meaning for us because now we've identified the spiritual rock as Christ. Well, let's keep going, verse five. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Hmm. What's the reason that, that Paul is saying that God was not pleased? What is that? Okay, unbelief, they didn't want to go to the promised land. They didn't believe that God could protect them and get them in. So basically that whole generation went away. Yes? Yeah, it wasn't safe. They looked at it in their own eyes and said, I can't go that way. And God wasn't going to force them to do that. So... They wanted to do something else, and, and, and they tried to. They were ready to go, and Moses said, no, you know, we can't go now. And then, if you remember the story, what did they want to do on their own? Sacrifice your children. Well, yeah, they did all of that too, but right after they were told they couldn't go in the promised land, they did something else. They wanted to, but they, but they did something else. They decided there's, there's a city right there. We're going to attack it and show we're ready. Had God told them to attack it? No, God had told them, we're not going to go in yet. We've got a long time. We've got, we've got to do some other things first. They didn't want to do that, so they did it on their own and their own self was a failure. Yep, didn't work. All right. 
Now, this is verse 6. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And the 23,000 fell on a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happen to them as an example. But... They were written down for our instructions on whom the end of the ages had come. So why was Paul reviewing all of this? We can learn from their lessons. It's an example. Well, what was um, what was the main example of that kind of was put in place to to teach about salvation, forgiveness of sins. What was that? Solomon built a a big one. David wanted to, but was told he couldn't. The, the, what was that? The The temple. But the temple was referred to as a place to worship. But along with that temple before, in the wilderness, what's one of the things that, that uh, had to be built? The tabernacle. And the tabernacle had this sacrificial system as part of it. Where is the first place that any type of a sacrifice is mentioned in the Bible? Adam and Eve. Soon after, because we have the story of Cain and Abel, and it started because of this jealousy, but there was a sacrifice there. So, we have this sacrificial system. My simple question is, what was the purpose of this sacrificial system? To teach us. Teach us what? What was that? To honor God. To be faithful. Now, um, let's let's go to um, another thing here I wanted to look at. And this is part of the sacrificial part of it. Because I, I think it's important that we understand some of the pieces and parts and how they fit together a little bit. And by the way, I'm not an expert on this. If you wanted me to teach you an algebra class... I can do that just fine, and I don't even need notes that much. I can look at the topic and I can do it. I always struggle going through these lessons because this is, I have to study just like everyone. And so then, then it's hard to get up and try and, and get something wonderful to come out, which means I don't. I try and get you to tell me wonderful things. So I'm going to ask some more questions here, but first of all, uh, Let's look at Leviticus 4, 32 to 35. But when we read through it, I want you to take the viewpoint of, of a person who is actually going to go through this. Not just reading about what's supposed to happen, but I want you to, to, to place yourself in that person's position because This is something they're going to do. So Leviticus 4, 32 through 35. If someone brings a lamb as their sin offering. Oh, let's pause right there, I guess. Why are they bringing this lamb? Okay, it's a sin offering, which means in their own mind, they recognize their sin. sin. It's kind of hard to bring a sin offering if you don't recognize you have sin. So, this person recognizes they have sin. They are to bring a female... uh, They're bringing the lamb, so they're to bring a female without defect. They are to lay their hand... 
on its head and slaughter it for a sin offering at the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered. Okay, I'm not a farmer. Um, when I was growing up, we had some animals where I lived. My, we had a little farm. And um, so my father from time to time would uh, sacrifice a chicken because my mother liked chicken, okay? And, but it's this little bird. Mostly we got eggs from it, but every once in a while one went away. And uh, so I, he, was, he, was, uh, he was doing that sacrifice system of his chickens, I think two of them on that day. And how, does, how do you kill a chicken? Bring its neck. Yeah, he didn't want to do that. Yeah, my father had a method too. He had a stump sitting out there. And uh, he placed the chicken down and brought the axe down. So, there's ways to do it. But, but this is a lamb, and what was the purpose of, why is this lamb being brought? It's a sacrifice because of sin. It's not because they needed some food. And so it, it has a different meaning to it. Uh, then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar and pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. And then you remove the fat, and the fat is removed from the lamb, the fellowship offering. And the priest shall burn it in the altar on top of the food as presented in this way. The priest will make atonement for them for the sin they have committed. What's this atonement thing? Okay, so... It, is it a, is, it's forgiveness is the word you used... You used a different terminology. Okay, so it's pointing forward, but, but what is it going to mean to that person right then? What is it? Because the atonement word was used, but what does that word atonement? Cleansing. At one moment. With whom? With God. This was, this was a system to remind the person that they have sinned, which separates them from God, but God is willing to forgive, and this is the ceremony we're going to use to remind you as a sinner that God has done what? Forgiven. Forgiven. Okay? Okay. Now, we'll come back to this a little bit more, but, but I think it's important that this is an important step. There was sin, there was separation, and this ceremony was to bring them back together, except are there people who did not go through this ceremony who recognize that they have sinned. The whole world. Are there people who recognize they have sinned and they want to get close back with God? Yes, yes we hope so. That's us. We recognize it. We want to get back to God. But... Uh, we don't go through sacrifices today. Oh, explain how. Christ. Christ. And the next text is from John 1.29. 
The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Did sacrificing that lamb make the person who brought that lamb whole again or correct in their life? Well, it did in the sight of God for a moment. Okay. In the sight of God, what God needed to see is someone who wants to be forgiven commitment. And so the ceremony that, that was done was to show there is a commitment to God and to doing what he asked us to do. And yes, we made mistakes. And so we go through this process. And, but our, our step is, it's kind of like a, a ladder. How many of you ever climbed a ladder? Once. once. Probably more than once. <laughs> Most of us have climbed ladders. We've done it more than once. If the rungs are, what is that, 10 inches apart? About 10 inches apart? So if the rungs are 10 inches apart and I can only lift my leg 8 inches, how quick do I go up? Very slowly. <laughs> the leg goes up and it falls back down, but you really don't climb a ladder. That's what the arms are for. Pull yourself up. And, and I... <laughs> okay. But I do like the idea there. Pull yourself up. Because that's what we want to do. If God's here, and we know that there's a path to get there, we want to pull ourselves up. You're... <laughs> You're earning your way in. And in fact, I think it's more like God reaches down and, and, or just says, you're standing on the ladder. Hold on. Let me bring it up. Because it's not something that we can do. Who sinned? Who forgave us? So, can we forgive ourselves? Well, we, we should. Mostly we forgive ourselves because we recognize how stupid we are and, and along those lines. But, but we didn't, and especially if we sin against ourselves, which is possible by how we treat ourselves and we treat our family and we treat our bodies and there's all sorts of things. But, but really, if we sin against God... God is the only one that forgive us, can forgive us. And guess what? He's done that. But due to this little ceremony thing, we now have to come up with, how do we know what's going on? So, let's go to another text. And I'm going to look at Hebrews... Four. Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. And Hebrews 4, verse 1, starts with something called rest. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands... Let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Okay, what's this promise of rest? It's a restoration with God. Restoration with God. I like that one. Well, let's read another verse. Sometimes one verse doesn't give all the answers, does it? So let's continue with Hebrews 4. Verse 1, we just read. Verse 2, For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Uh, okay, is that perfectly clear yet? I struggle with Hebrews a little bit. 
So let's read another verse. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said, as I swore, swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Okay, let's see if we can pull out some pieces and parts here. Uh, for we who have believed entered that rest. So what does it take to enter whatever this rest is? To believe. To believe. Okay. And, and then there's a quote. Let me check my little cross-reference here. It says it's from 90, Psalm 9511. Okay. Um, turn that back down. Uh, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Well, what is, what's the foundation of the world? The creation. Creation. Okay, so we're getting a little bit more information here. A couple of days. A couple of days. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Okay, so uh, when, when did these works become finished? From the beginning. From the beginning. So you have this creation. And after that, his works are finished. Hmm. The substitution and forgiveness, the overall plan is there, isn't it? Whether we accept it or not, that's the problem. Let's read verse 4. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Okay, so where does that come from? God rested on the seventh day. It's from Genesis. Where is it repeated? Or the idea repeated again? Exodus and Deuteronomy. In Exodus, what was the main reason for this resting? But why was he given, why were they told to remember this day? In Exodus, we remember this rest day, this Sabbath day, because of creation. What God has done in creation. In Deuteronomy, we remember this day because of what God has done, as far as the Israelites concerned, for the getting them out of Egypt. Well, that's kind of interesting because in one of them, it's remember what I've done in creation. Another one was remember what I've done in getting you out of here. Uh, so, but it's still remembering, right? It's remembering what God has done. And for God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Which means he's talking about it. He's you know bringing in texts from different places. So, but we're we're now getting something here. This rest is something that God established. It has to do with what God has done for His people, and more than that, what He first did for entire creation, the world. Then it's for His people. Let's keep going. Since therefore, this is verse six now. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day. Today, saying, through David, so long afterwards, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay. Verse 8. 
For if Joshua had given them rest. Okay. Oh, we're jumping around here. Now we're back to Joshua. I haven't even heard of Joshua before in this series of events. What, what was the thing about Joshua? What did Joshua do that was so important to the Israelite nation? Yes, eventually, eventually, yes, further down. Okay, who led them into the land that God had promised them? Joshua. Moses didn't. Moses was, couldn't. He had died by that time because of things he had done. And he recognized it and accepted that. Sometimes, even though we are forgiven, there are still consequences so now we have joshua so now we're okay so the israelites are now in the new land and guess what god would not have spoken of another day later on so they hadn't received the rest yet but i thought getting into the promised land was the rest <laughs> yeah it wasn't a rest for very long, was it? Yeah. Once again, they go through a cycle, and they all died. Yeah. So, if God created this rest after creation, and told them to remember it because now we were getting out of Egypt, and they were looking forward to this rest in the promised land, and it's still not there. But it, didn't, it didn't come for them. It didn't it come, come for them. them. No. It, it, they died in the wilderness, and, and the, the rest does come in the promised land. Yeah, the promised land is still coming. Okay. <laughs> There's been a long misunderstanding of what that promised land really is, isn't it? And that's where we keep getting stuck. Because we're looking very local. No matter what it is, we're kind of too localized. And we forget to look far enough ahead. Um... Anyway, it, they didn't receive it in the promised land. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been mentioned in Psalms with David that they hadn't mentioned it yet. And there's just all sorts of problems with that. And what is the main problem that we get? Why haven't we entered this rest? Because we choose sin. We choose sin. And it's not like we have to spend a lot of time going through that because we see it around us. Um, we have sin. We've hardened our hearts. Why? Why? I, I always, it always intrigued me, the phrase used a couple of times or several times in Judges. What is... I think it's a very famous phrase from Judges. Do any of you know what I'm thinking of? And everyone did. Oh, evil in the eyes of the Lord. What was that? And everyone went their own, did their own thing. They did their own thing. Everyone did what was right according to their in their own eyes, according to what they thought. Yeah, yeah, okay? So that's, we keep relying on ourself. What, what chapter was Judges? What chapter and verse? I do not know that one, but I can get it for you. <laughs> there's, there's one, yeah, there, there's, it's in the end of the book, but I'm not sure if it's the very last or the last chapter, but. I'll find it right now. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's look at this. Um, and I find out where I am on here. So, we have sin, we have hardened hearts, we do not rest with God. What, what, is, what is this rest then trying to refer to? Judges 21, 25. Thank you. <laughs> Great. What is this? What is this rest now? I mean, we, we know it's not just a single day. A thousand years rest, and after that, it's all work again? No, it's That's a recreation. So what really is the rest that we're looking forward to? A relationship with God. Relationship with God, because with that relationship, then we can move forward. And rest in Him because of that relationship. Ah, it's eternal. Yes, we think of this thousand years, but that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. Okay, so I I want to um, skip through and go to some more stuff. It can begin today. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Because we have a relationship all right um, let's look at Hebrews 4 again and I'm just going to do Verses 8 through 11, fairly quick. Hebrews 4, 8 through 11. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works. Just as God did from his, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Who is there in this case? The early, the Israelites. And, you know, we, we talk about the Israelites, uh, but uh, it, it's apparently everyone. It's, we're all in that group. We, we want to do things our way. And so this rest then is more than just a period of time. We use the Sabbath as part of that period of time, but as a representation of a relationship that goes on. So, let's look at Galatians 3, 26 through 29. So in Christ Jesus, let me rephrase that without slaughtering the words. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Hmm. So now we're taking a step beyond Israel beyond Judaism, and we are all what? Children of God. Children of God. Through faith. Through faith. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What does that through faith mean? Where we stand, where we live, where we are. It really has to be. Well...
believers and non-believers because the gift of God could be as great as it could be, but if I don't believe in it, it makes no sense to me. It's, it doesn't do any good to me. Okay. But if the one sitting next to me has faith in that, that atonement was good enough for him that he becomes saved. It's the same gift from God, but I didn't accept it, and he did, so he got eternal life, and I didn't. So that's what so, oh, yes, yeah, something. Acceptance is important. I think it's the difference. It's what makes the difference between one and the other. How many of you were here when I was teaching in the gym and I had some C's candy? How many of you got some? How many of you asked for it? You got two. I, I think the point of that is I have some and I was willing to give it to you. But you have to accept it. Because I did walk by some people and ask, do you want one? And they said, no. No. Now, they didn't know what the illustration was. It was, you know, I don't do those illustrations planned before time so that people know what the right answer is because they may have a perfectly good reason why they didn't want to seize candy. Maybe they don't like candy. Maybe, don't like candy. Don't that, candy. maybe that's a mental deficiency they have. I don't know. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> well, okay, maybe mine's a mental deficiency because I do. Uh, yeah. Or a diabetic. There could be a reason that they won't take it. But in this case, it, it, it looks like, I'll keep reading here. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Okay, so clothe yourself with Christ. What does that mean? Robe of truth, okay? Okay. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, you are then Abraham's seed, which means all of the promises given to Abraham and his descendants are ours. And heirs according to the promise. So, what is this rest we're waiting for? Christ's return. We're waiting for Christ's return, but. I believe there are many in this room who are currently in God's rest. Because we have accepted, or you have accepted, what God has given. And there are others who, in the back of your mind, still think that but I didn't do anything yet. I didn't perfect this. I didn't, I, I still have these sins in my life. God still owes you. God, what do you mean by that? Same thing. I, I thought that it was something that was coming that, that God was going to give me later. And then someone told me, Bill, all you need to do is accept it and it's yours. It's ours now. Does that mean, by the way, before I ask that question, who was the person, the king of Israel, who was referred to after uh, a man after God's own heart? 
And what did that mean for David? He sought after him wholeheartedly, and he always succeeded? No. No. But when he failed, he repented, he went back to God. So, we don't expect ourselves to live perfect lives. Not here. here. (laughs) Yeah, it's a good thing, too. Um... Too much candy. I know. You can tell. Uh, so the rest is here for us. If we choose it. We choose it. Yep. And it's real. And it's real. Well, I'm supposed to end in one minute because that's what I think it says in the program unless it got changed. I never know sometimes, 9.45 to 10.40, but we usually end five minutes later. So, let's not change. Well, so, I have a couple of questions here. What do we use today to remember God's rest plans for us? We study as church. But remember, how do we start this whole lesson? With a ceremony. Sacrificial ceremony. Was that the answer to to sin? No, No, but it was to lead people to, to say, this is what I've done. And through going through this process, God has made it possible before me I just need to accept it. So what, what do we do? Well, in my mind, that's why we're here. Amen. We are here because we want that rest God is offering us, and so the Sabbath is part of that. It's a weekly reminder that, uh, and by the way, we need reminders. Yes? But, but this isn't an Yes, it's a taste of the rest coming in the future. Well, that answered my next question, too. So, I don't know. I had a whole bunch of things to go through, and then once I start, I never know where we're going to end up. What does the term atonement mean? At one moment, but what does it mean for us? We are reconciled with God. We are at one with God. We have the same purposes. We don't have the same knowledge. We don't have the same perfection, but we can have the same purpose. I think that's one of the things that uh, is important to remember through all this. There is a purpose. These are not just random things that were done. We have a purpose. I become one with him and I become one with God. 
in God. And, and I, don't, I don't understand it, okay? What that's going to be, because I can't, okay? But I'm beginning to understand that it's real, okay? And that, that, um, that acceptance and that choice yeah. is mine. Yes. And I want to stay in it. Amen. And that's why I come to church. Because I know my head in the nanosecond <laughs> can go to sin. Okay? Yeah. And it looks good. I think it would be a good test for everybody, no matter what religion, to read Psalm 119. The whole chapter, Psalm 119. Mm-hmm. Psalm 119, yes. Okay. Well, we do need to bring this to a close. How did I start today? I talked about my little model car that I tried to build and and how successful was I? Failed. I failed. Well, I didn't fail. It was there, but not, not presentable. I never, I never built a motorcycle. But if I had, it would not give me nearly the joy of riding my motorcycle. And I don't get to ride it as often as I'd like to because there's either too hot, too many bugs, and I hate other people on the road because they're idiots and I'm the only sane driver. But the fact is, the model of a car or a motorcycle or a plane isn't real, but it helps us get some joy and understanding of what the real thing is. And we've got the real thing coming. The real thing is here. And it comes, but, but we are heading where we can continue to study and learn and come closer with God. The best is yet to come. That's a nice way to end it. Let's bow our heads for prayers. prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for being with us through this study. I especially want to thank you for everyone who is here and their ideas that they shared, because it is through these ideas that you inspire and enrich all of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.